Power is a word that uh, Americans are just very uncomfortable with. Now, I must say that we know it. We know that there's the other side of the tracks and there's the people that live in the nice houses. We have all of these euphemisms that we use for uh, power structures and for social classes. I think that there very definitely is an upper class in the United States and indeed that's been the starting point of my research. If a group is a, a dominant group or a ruling group, we would expect them to have more of what uh, people value in a society. And certainly this uh, upper social class we've been talking about has more wealth, it has more income, uh, it certainly has access to the best, best education and health care and so on. So on all the measures of who benefits, uh, I think there's, that shows that they are a ruling class. There is what I call a corporate community, which means that the large corporations in America are interconnected through ownership, through sharing of information, through putting out products together, uh, through having the same directors, uh, through uh, hiring each other's managers, that it truly is, in that sense, a community. This is where we get back to this question about, is there a power structure? Americans are used to thinking, well, if there's a power structure, we wouldn't even be allowed to be in politics. But in America, you're allowed to run for president. You can run for anything you want. There's just one thing. You better have several million dollars or access to people that, that have several million dollars. So you see, we can say on the one hand, well, it's very fair. Anybody can run. But in fact, not anybody can when you get down to the specifics of the matter. So we have a formally open and liberal system. But in practice, the way things work out is that the rich get richer uh, and they are able to continue a set of policies that, uh, that maximize their advantages. We're going to find out who rules America with the country's foremost expert, right now on Alternative Views. If there's one subject that you will not see on the traditional media, particularly television, it's something about the American power structure. Who has power? Who benefits from this? Who controls things, influences things? Well, we have the man with us tonight who knows more about power than anybody else in the country. You may know him by the name of G. William Domhoff from a lot of his books. The first uh, book which he came out with, as far as I know, was C. Wright Mills and the Power Elite. C. Wright Will Mills was the first one to come up with a comprehensive look at power in the United States in 1956. And then uh, Bill's first big book, comprehensive book, was Who Rules America, which has been read by many, many people, and others such as The Bohemian Grove, The Higher Circles, The Powers That Be, and the most recent one, Who Rules America Now? If you want to find out just who does rule America, and it ain't you and I, well, you re want to read that book. I want to, uh, Bill, ask you his first question by using a quote from C. Wright Mills in his book, Power Elite, or some other book. He said, if, you, if somebody starts talking about power and the use of power, you're automatically a muckraker. Right. Uh, <laughs> power is a word that uh, Americans are just very uncomfortable with. We, we're willing to talk about influence, and what we basically like to believe is that individuals and groups can join together 
uh, to influence specific issues. But power is something that happens in Europe. It's, it's part of the whole American experience to put no emphasis upon the idea of social class and to put no emphasis on the idea of power. Why do you think this is? I think that it comes out of, uh, out of the uh, classic liberal tradition and out of American history of rebelling against the, uh, the uh, king in, in, in the American Revolution. But, and then from there, I think it's because the American experience has been s seemingly very individualistic. That is, people have moved across the country. There is evidence of upward mobility. Uh, people have become uh, wealthy. They have been able to get education and change their station in life a little bit. Um, and I think that then reinforces this kind of, of belief. So that the idea that there is a power structure and a social structure is then something that, um, that we, we want to ignore. Now, I must say that we know it. We know that there's the other side of the tracks and there's the people that live in the nice houses. We have all of these euphemisms that we use for uh, power structures and for social classes. What is the dominant view in the universities in the United States mm -hmm. of what you call the power structure? I think the dominant view in, uh, in the university is something we call pluralism, which says that uh, influence in the United States is exercised by specific individuals who come together as a coalition or an interest group to work on one particular kind of issue. So we always stay at the level of individuals and groups, and we never talk in terms of long-standing institutional structures which sounds pretty abstract, but that gets down to things like corporations or foundations that for 60 or 80 years have been giving out great amount of money to, to influence directions that uh, policy take. I think that whole, that whole kind of level drops out of our thinking, and, and I think that our educational system does reinforce that. And what led you to take this different approach to power? Why did you become dissatisfied with the pluralist approach and start looking at the power structure? In different terms. I think that uh, for me it, it was probably because of many of the events of the 1960s when people tried to uh, exercise their rights such as in the civil rights movement or such as in the um, uh, anti-war movement of the time or even in some of the attempts by consumer advocates such as Ralph Nader uh, basically when when they seemed to be meeting a stone wall then you kind of uh, uh, think there may be something else more there. I like what Ralph Nader said in, in, regard, to, uh, in, in regard to your question. That he says, said is that if you want to find out about the power structure, you've got to go out there and kind of bump up against it. Uh, the way you find it's there is when you hit these brick walls. And uh, uh, as I saw that happening, I, I got more interested in uh, trying to see if there was this class and institutional structure. And basically, I started out in, a, I think, a good old American way by trying to trace individuals in their, in, their, um, um, in their activities. And what I found standing behind these individuals, I believe, are Lord, large corporations, large foundations, a series of research institutes, a series of policy discussion groups that make it so that a David Rockefeller uh, is not merely an individual, but is in fact constantly um, involved, whether it's with a bank or his foundation or policy discussion group like the Council on Foreign Relations, and then one begins to see that there's an ongoing institutional structure. And so that even then when David Rockefeller retires, you see that the people that now run Chase Manhattan Bank, that now are the directors of the Council on Foreign Relations, continue to be the people that run uh, uh, the country. So that uh, when you get a little time perspective on it, you start to see the individuals change a little bit, but that they come from the same social background and they come from the same large uh, institutions. So I tried then to find that uh, structure that stood behind our uh, individual actions. Well, let's take a look at this. And for I guess we should start with the class, the class structure and class nature of the United States. Now, we hear about middle class very frequently. It's written, a lot of things are studied about the middle class, and a lot of things have been written about the middle class. You see frequently lower middle class and lower... 
but you don't see too much written about upper class. Now, if there's a middle class, there has to be an upper, right? Okay. I think that there very definitely is an upper class in the United States, and indeed, that's been the starting point of my research, is to start with uh, social clubs, exclusive private schools, summer resorts, to start with what uh, uh, we can see if we will but look, uh, to see these people as a set of interacting and intermarrying a set of families who have developed a whole set of uh, social institutions that preserve their way of life. Once we have located these various schools, clubs, resorts, retreats, debutante balls, then we can understand uh, the uh, historical continuity of uh, social upper class in America. It's my belief that uh, about uh, half a percent of Americans are part of what I would call a social upper class. Uh, and these people uh, own about 20 to 25 percent of all the privately held wealth in the United States. That is, if we took all of your wealth, which might be your car, your house, your insurance policy, if we threw in your guitar, uh, everything, <laughs> we took all of that wealth plus the stocks and bonds and real estate in America, we put all that in a big pile, 20 to 25 percent of all of that one half of one percent of the people have that in the United States. And what my thesis basically says is that those people that have that 20 to 25 percent of all the privately held wealth are not mere individuals that are scattered here and there and are kind of rare and don't know each other, but in fact they uh, uh, are, are closely knit. They know each other, they see the world the same way, they do discuss with each other, uh, the kinds of policies that they think uh, would uh, further their way of life. So in that sense, we then talk about them um, in this more sociological abstract sense that uh, they're not just families, because in fact, there, there are these ongoing institutional uh, kinds of structures, and they are uh, uh, structures that do matter. And they make a difference to a lot of Americans uh, as they attempt to emulate these people, as they attempt to become part of these uh, institutions and so on. Now, under this, their uh, institutions and their structures do uh, two things, or three. They, first, they perpetuate themselves. They exclude other people. They have mechanisms to exclude other people from joining them. Absolutely. And, but they also, they use the mechanisms to bring up new blood when they think these people have the right credentials and the right i think uh one of the most dramatic examples that i know of that frank concerns the way in which uh moderate uh members of the upper class responded to the uh civil rights movement of the 60s and the uh rebellions that were going on in the inner cities in the ghettos at that time and that was that a number of these institutions of which we're talking decided that uh they really had to find the best and the brightest of the black community and to educate them so they could be uh, more a part of the, of the corporate structure. And what they simply did was to get money from the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations and a couple others, and then to go to leading private schools and say, we want to create a scholarship program for black students. And this program is called ABC, A Better Chance. And literally, over the space then of 10 or 15 years, uh, many thousands of young black students were taken into these prep schools and then from there went on to major colleges and universities with fellowships. And these people are now out there in their 30s, uh, being uh, in the media, being in corporate law, working for uh, corporations. We've interviewed some of these people, and it's very fascinating the way in, and it shows you so nicely about class because these people gradually take on the style and manner of the school of which they were a part. And they, they tell us it's very funny that they'll go home and people say, you're starting to talk different. Mm -hmm. you're, and, and they say, you know, it's, I go and I like to visit my family, but my other friends, I don't have anything in common with them anymore. And that's what we mean you see by then a social class. If, if one has read all about uh, American history and knows about various kinds of, uh, of arts that most people don't know about, if you've had European vacations, um, then you want to talk to other people that can talk your language. Uh, and, and gradually then these people come to feel different 
from the very uh, group that they originally came from. I use this example because I think it is so dramatic in the sense that we're taking very poor people uh, out, of, out of a ghetto and taking them to this private school where they're one of two or three or four black people. At what age, by the way? Oh, 14, 15, 16. Uh -huh. and, uh, and making them part of this class in the sense of putting them there and then, and then they gradually just out of human processes of while you're at school you certainly want to relate to other people, you want to get along and before you know it you're like the people that uh, that uh, you're going to school with. It's socialization. I mean, that's right, the process. Exactly. Are these people uh, intermarrying with their white social cl uh, social upper class people, or do they bring black women into this there program are, as well? There are black women in the program as well, um, and I don't know the answer to that question in terms of any systematic data yet. We've only interviewed a few mm -hmm. of the people, but definitely then there is uh, some intermarriage. I guess the next big question then, there is this upper class in the United States. Is it a ruling class, a governing class? And is it cohesive? Yeah, I, I, I believe that uh, first it is cohesive and, and secondly that uh, it is a ruling class. I think that we see the cohesion in the fact that uh, these people are members of each other's clubs, so to speak. That is, if we look at club memberships all over the United States, we would find that uh, a leading banker in New York may well be in clubs in Los Angeles and, and San Francisco. We find in the case of a club I've studied with uh, some care called the Bohemian Club in San Francisco that people from all of the United States come to its two-week retreat in the last uh, part of July and uh, sleep together in tents and huts and teepees and just kind of go to summer camp together. They literally do go to, to uh, summer camp uh, together. There's a lot of that kind of social cohesiveness. There's also cohesiveness in the corporate world in that they sit on each other's corporate boards. So that uh, the head of Chase Manhattan Bank, such as David Rockefeller until recent years, will sit on two or three other corporation boards. But the head of those corporations will also sit on the board of Chase Manhattan Bank. So they take in each other's laundry at the economic uh, uh, level as well. They also come together to talk about more general issues whether it's uh, foreign policy or kinds of domestic policy, at what I call discussion groups. But this means organizations like the Committee for Economic Development, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Conference Board, the Business Council. Uh, there's numerous of these groups. So I think there is cohesiveness uh, in this uh, group as a social class and, as, and in terms of its economic interest. We've been talking a lot or referring to the Council on Foreign Relations, Committee for Economic Development, Trilateral Commission. Let's talk in greater detail about the policy planning mechanisms, some of these organizations mm -hmm. that we've been talking about, because I think this is probably the thing that people know least about. Mm -hmm. You don't find them in history books, yeah. and you don't find them in economics textbooks and all. Mm -hmm. Tell us about these. Basically, these, were, uh, these organizations were all created at different times in the 20th century in the face of particular problems that were faced by, by the, the corporate class. community. Mm -hmm. In the case of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, it was formed shortly after World War I when uh, uh, states people came and corporate leaders came back from Versailles. And they said, we have to have a better perspective on foreign relations now that we're clearly going to be the dominant power in the world. And they created this discussion group in order to make themselves more sophisticated about these issues. These, these organizations are funded by large corporations and by foundations. They then bring together these business people for discussions with academic experts. These academic experts are basically housed at institutes on major campuses, the Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, Berkeley, MIT, Caltech, Nexus. And these experts are also housed at think tanks like the uh, Rand Corporation and various institutes for strategic thinking here, there, and everywhere. So what we have at a policy discussion group is the bringing together of a variety of academic opinions with this range of corporate leaders. And they then discuss a particular issue, as I say, a foreign policy issue, a monetary policy issue, a particular domestic issue. And they try to work out ideas that make sense to all of them. Now, from the corporate point of view, 
by listening, say they got a liberal academic and a more conservative academic in the same room, and they listen to you guys argue. And then they see what makes sense in terms of their, their view. view of the world. And interest. Economic right. And social. So I might then, so then in that situation, now, beyond then becoming sophisticated about policies, they also, you see, are looking at each other in terms of who can do this more general kind of task, meaning this, and I think we've all seen it in our lives. We have friends that might be very good at their particular job. They might be very good, say, at, at running a business. But if you ask them to do a more general thing, like be on the city council, they maybe don't do very well because they don't relate well to other groups. We see this with faculty people, people that do a fine job in their department. But maybe they would, you wouldn't want them on a general committee of the faculty because they, they're impatient with student demands or they get angry with the administration. So we say, we don't want to put that person on that mm -hmm. committee. So what they do is informally learn about each other's leadership capability. But what I, that's one thing that's learned at these organizations. But the other thing that's learned is which academic expert makes sense to me and can I personally relate to? So it's at these organizations that you meet somebody like a Henry Kissinger and you say, he not only makes sense, but I get along with him personally. So you develop then this, this relationship between the corporate community and, and the expert community at these organizations. So they are a place where these people get a more general view, where they get sophisticated, where they informally select each other as leaders, where they inject academic opinion into their, into their perspectives, where they uh, look academic experts over to become potential advisors in the government. And then, and very importantly, what these organizations do is they legitimate these people as fair-minded experts. You see, the interesting thing about politics in America in terms of policies as opposed to electing individuals is that the po political organizations of the ruling class are not called political. Now, this seems, uh, is this an irony? Yeah, in a way. That is, all the groups in America that are called nonpartisan, bipartisan, nonpolitical, that's the political organizations mm -hmm. of the ruling class in America. You see, if you go out and say, I don't understand how you can talk about a ruling class. There's the Democrats over here and there's the Republicans over here. That's politics, isn't it? No, that's just deciding which individuals will fill offices. Politics in the important sense of, of which policies we all agree are, make sense, that happens in non-political organizations. So when uh, the Committee for Economic Development puts out a statement, it says, the Committee for Economic Development, a nonpartisan group of <laughs> yeah. business people, today suggested we alter the Social Security system in the following way. S and then they say, look, some of our members are Democrats, some of our members are Republicans. We're trying to get something that's good for all of America. We're trying to transcend politics. We're trying to do something that's, that's in the national interest. Now, once you say, yeah, that's fair, we've got to get beyond this fight between Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> they're, they're, they're people that have, they can run an organization, their success in America. And then we identify with them because of their high status and, and because they're part of this fair-minded organization. Academic experts from Har Harvard have helped them and from Yale. And who are we? you know, to, to argue with somebody from Harvard and Yale, plus a successful business leader. And that's what we call legitimation, uh, in, in my mind, of, of their policies. And we respect them. I know that because I, when I go around and, and talk about these things or debate these things and so on, many times people will stand up afterwards and they'll say, hey, who, why shouldn't uh, the man from General Motors run the country? He's a winner. Uh, he's shown, uh, like Iacocca, they're talking about Iacocca should be president, right? Mm -hmm. Look at him. He's a wonderful guy. He's proven it. He's, he's run these corporations. What do you want for nothing? In other words, that's, that has made him somebody that Americans will, will accept and relate to, and, and they'll go along with those policies. So that's the a role, then, to come back to these organizations that they play, this kind of legitimation of policies that are in the general interest of the ruling class and are labeled uh, uh, nonpartisan. And then these policies not only are put into effect, but also the people from these organizations are placed in positions of decision-making power in the government. Right. And I think that the policies, incidentally, to be a little academic about it, I think that the policies could be implemented without necessarily putting the people in government. But it's the fact that the people that go into, gov go into government, that's what we can see most clearly, and that's mm -hmm. what people can kind of 
uh, can kind of relate to or identify with. They can see what you're talking about if you show the movement of Donald Reagan from Merrill Lynch to the business roundtable to government. And then if you say the same thing happens under Democrats, or if you show the movement of Henry Kissinger from Harvard to the Council on Foreign Relations to the paid staff of Nelson Rockefeller, and then finally to the government with, uh, under Nixon, then we can see that the, uh, what's happening. It might be that a lot of times that, that important policies come out of these organizations without necessarily the particular person coming to government. Uh, incidentally, where to put this then at a level of persons again, from the point of view of these academic experts, what they're trying to do is to attach themselves to somebody that they think is going to be successful. Because the culmination of, of an academic expert's career is to be a Henry K Kissinger. And, he, and when I say that, I'm thinking of Brzezinski. Brzezinski was always sort of in the shadow of Kissinger. But he was always in these discussion groups I'm talking about. He headed an important think tank at Columbia, and he was always in Council on Foreign Relations Study Group. Well, David Rockefeller asked Brzezinski to head up the staff for this organization called the Trilateral Commission, which is a discussion group of, of uh, prominent leaders from the Western European nations plus Japan plus the United States. Incidentally, they're all people, all these countries have a Council on Foreign Relations, and they're basically people from the National Council on Foreign Relations. David Rockefeller asked Brzezinski to head this, uh, uh, the staff for this, this uh, new discussion group that started in the 70s. And when the man from Coca-Cola suggested to David Rockefeller that Jimmy Carter be a part of that group, Brzezinski met Carter. At the, tri council, at the Trilateral Commission. Now, from Brzezinski's point of view, he looked and he said, this guy might make it to president. I'm going to bet on him, in effect. And the result will be, I get to be a national security advisor someday. <laughs> so there is that whole subjective part of what the academic is doing there in terms of, this is a guy I can relate to, and I think he's going to be a winner. So we could, I could explain all of, of, of what I've been talking about from a subjective careerist point of view for an individual like a Kissinger or a Brzezinski. But the, my point is, is he, a lot of them have bet on the wrong guy. That is, they decided they were going to work for George Romney. Well, who remembers George <laughs> Romney? You know? Or they decided they were going to uh, work for some particular Democrat that, that lost out somewhere, made a fatal faux pas. And uh, so we don't hear of them. But they probably maybe had some important policy inputs, but they themselves did not arrive in the government because they bet on the wrong political horse. So what this, these organizations do is to very much limit the range of policies that uh, are even that is even discussable. That's right. And they, what is legitimated in the uh, in the, the the minds of the American people, and also in Congress. That's right. But there's a parallel thing that goes on in public opinion shaping too, is there not? I think so. And I think the important thing to say is that is is precisely what you just did, and that is, it's not that these people sort of just pour opinions into our head, but rather that they try to manage the limits of respectable opinion, which are fairly wide as those things go in the world, but nonetheless, kinds of liberal opinions and kinds of ultra-conservative opinions get labeled in some way as too utopian or too kooky or un-American. And or too extreme or too yeah, radical. Right, and we can, like you know, you know the, the, the way the ultra-conservatives do it is to call it anti, you know, to call it communist or socialist <laughs> or un-American. The moderates say, sounds awfully utopian to me. Or it sounds awfully academic. <laughs> I mean, the, the appeal is to the practical. If we can legitimate something as practical and American, then it's okay. But very definitely, there's a constant argument that goes on to try to keep some opinions not respectable. And to see that, you have to look historically at some particular argument. And here I just say quickly that the best example of that involves uh, the famous economist John Maynard Keynes and his views about the use of government spending to, to stabilize a capitalist economy. There are many ways of being, there are many policies that follow from Keynes. There are many different things you could do and be a Keynesian. But what happened in America from 1935 to 1965 was essentially an intellectual struggle in which the business community was, saw that a very conservative Keynesianism would make sense to them, but that a more liberal Keynesianism uh, they, didn't want, they didn't want to accept and furthermore weren't forced to accept because our working class 
is not powerful enough organizationally to force a liberal kind of Keynesianism such as happens in uh, uh, Sweden, say. So basically what, was, what Keynes said in the, the middle 30s slowly got whittled down. In the, just the way you described, got whittled down, and so we have a, a, a very conservative kind of Keynesianism. And now, right now, in America, we are seeing the amazing thing, whether intentionally or not, we are seeing the amazing and complete application of Keynesian economics to the American economy by somebody who, A, totally rejects Keynes, and claims he's a supply sider, and C, doesn't understand economics, and this is Ronald Reagan. But what has happened is that we've just had a total Keynesian recovery in the United States, because the key thing in Keynes is you run a deficit and you do government spending. Now, that's what Ronald Reagan has done, but it's all, of course, been military spending, and we call it a military Keynesianism. Ronald Reagan is behaving as a Keynesian, even while saying he's not. And he may not know he's a Keynesian. I don't know with him. You I know, you it. never know. <laughs> so there, is, there are a whole set of mechanisms that legitimate some opinions and make other opinions seem far out or not worth studying. Bill, the, ma the mass media do this, too. My studies of the mass media, I find that once this policy <laughs> has been set, that the media will follow up on this and you will not find any discussion on anything on the other side mm -hmm. of this yeah. preset agenda by these people you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Or if it is discussed, it's highly criticized, but generally it's just ignored. Mm -hmm. Isn't there, a, yeah. isn't there one, another aspect of determining whether a ruling class is uh, also a governing class? Uh, or the upper class is also a ruling class, and that is you have to look at where the decision makers come from mm -hmm. to see if the prime decision makers come from this ruling class or the people whom this ruling class is selected to right. work. I think that that's another very useful way of, of understanding about power uh, because it's the most visible to us. That is, we can watch people. We, may, we right now are not, we don't know what's being talked about and said usually at the National Security Council or in the uh, private meetings in the White House. But we sure do know who's there. And uh, to give you an example, if we take uh, the Secretary of Treasury uh, as a, an important position, and we look at um, uh, a few of them. For instance, under Kennedy, uh, who ran on a, uh, a, a platform of getting the country moving again, uh, we've got to get beyond this stodgy Republican establishment, and so on. And yet, when he was elected, the person he put in charge of Treasury was a man named C. Douglas Dillon, from a man worth several hundreds of millions of dollars, who from a major investment uh, uh, house in, uh, in New York. When we jump to Jimmy Carter, who was our populist, and uh, Hamilton Jordan uh, assured us that we were going to see new faces, uh, in fact, the person that we got as our Secretary of Treasury was a man named W. Michael Blumenthal, who was the head of Bendix Corporation, a trustee of the Council on Foreign Relations, a trustee of the Committee for Economic Development, a trustee of Princeton University, uh, and a member of the Trilateral Commission. And he becomes our Secretary of Treasury. Now, Ronald Reagan comes in, and he's going to get rid of the mess in Washington from a neoconservative <laughs> perspective. But our Secretary of Treasury is a man named Donald Reagan, or was. Uh, it was his first Secretary of Treasury, as you know, and, and Donald Reagan was from Merrill Lynch. He was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He was a trustee of the Committee for Economic Development. He was a trustee of the Business Roundtable. And what I'm saying, of course, with those examples is that uh, when we look at the cabinet-level appointments of the past 40 years, at the least, but we could go back further. But if we look at the last 40 years, that whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, whether it's a populist or a neoconservative, whatever particular ticket they run on or ideology they run on in order to attract a coalition of voters, when they turn to the question of governing, when they turn to the question of how are they going to implement a set of policies, they do, as your question uh, suggests, they turn to the same group of people that have been uh, both made sophisticated about issues in these policy discussion groups and have been made legitimate in these policy discussion groups as having more than just the perspective of their particular corporation, but also that they are statespersons. That is, that they are people that look at the broader picture. Um, so the continuity of, of these people is very great. I also want to add to that, Frank, now that you got me kind of rolling on it, <laughs> is that this also involves experts in America. 
not just uh, uh, multi-millionaires and corporate executives, but very important experts are part of this uh, 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 power elite that we're talking about as well. And, and what I'm then saying is that, that councils on foreign relations, committees for economic development and so on, actually have basically a monopoly of the respectable expertise in the United States. The people that are sound and sensible. These are, are all in quotes, respectable, right. sound, sound, and Henry respectable. Kissinger being one example. Yeah, and that's Kissinger exactly is where I'm headed, sound. is to Henry Kissinger. Yeah. If we look at the career of Henry Kissinger, we, we might say, well, only in America. <laughs> uh, in one way, yes, because here is a person who's an escapee from, from uh, Nazi Germany, who by going to school here, by doing well at Harvard, we can say, look at him, he's been very important. And he has. But here is the other part of, of, of Kissinger's career that's so important. While he was at Harvard, he was uh, seen by a man named Mick George Bundy, oh. who was the dean of the faculty, or the head of the faculty, and uh, from a prominent Boston family. His father is a corporation lawyer. Uh, in other words, he's a well-to-do person uh, that happened to be in the academic world. And he called his friends at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he said, you know, this guy Kissinger is a bright young guy, and he could really be useful in some of the discussion groups. And so Kissinger was invited to be in these discussion groups, and Nelson Rockefeller was really taken with Kissinger, and he basically then hired him to write things for him and to write things for panels of experts that the Rockefellers set up. Well, in the late 60s, the interesting thing is that, of course, that Richard Nixon, appointed Kissinger as his foreign policy advisor. Now, the first reason that's interesting is that supposedly Nixon and, Kiss and, and Rockefeller, excuse me, that Nixon and Rockefeller were so different, they had all their political conflicts, and yet Nixon was perfectly willing to hire what seemed to be, quotes, Nelson Rockefeller's man. But beyond that, the interesting thing is that uh, two years after the election, at a point when uh, Kissinger's star was, was quite high, uh, Hubert Humphrey was interviewed, was ta they were talking about what he would have done if he was uh, uh, president. And he said, well, it's funny, he said, one of the things I was going to do was appoint Henry Kissinger. He had talked to Henry Kissinger before the election saying, if I'm elected, will you be my foreign policy advisor? My point is, of course, whether we get Nixon or whether we get Humphrey, there was one thing we were sure we were going to get, and that was Kissinger. He was the Rockefeller man. Uh, yeah, but start. basically, by that time, of course, he's known to many of these corporate people. His expertise is very useful to them. Uh, he's been legitimated through being part of these organizations so, so. like the Council. But then let's take it down to, to what I think is uh, also interesting in terms of the continuity of, of a power structure. Let's take it down to the early 1980s, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, in part, ran on a platform that was practically running against Henry Kissinger. One of the things the very conservative Republicans do not like is what they call the Eastern Establishment, and one of their favorite pet peeves within the Eastern Establishment is the Council on Foreign Relations, and one part of that is Henry Kissinger. Well, what do we end up with, though? Within a year or two, we have Henry Kissinger as head of the President's Commission on Central America. In other words, Ronald Reagan also then hires Henry Kissinger. So when you just trace the career of that man, you then see the continuity in the power structure. But at the same time, we're back to our earlier point about, are we just talking about individuals? No, we're not, because we have to understand that Kissinger first was at a very important institution called Harvard, which is one of the main reservoirs of expertise, as well as a place for upward mobility, where uh, experts are seen by members of the ruling class, whether they're uh, McGeorge Bundy or whether they're trustees of the university. Then he went to the Council on Foreign Relations where he was part of a discussion group of 20 or 30 people from all over the country, people from the CIA, people from the State Department, people from corporations, people from law firms, other academic experts. And in that situation, he, they say, this person sees the world the way we do, and he has information that's, that's very useful to us. Uh, and so it's this institutional setting that he's moved through that brings him into uh, uh, the power structure. Bill, could we move now yeah. to the economic foundation okay. of this uh, power structure? Well, I think that, uh, in a simple phrase, they are the owners and managers of large corporations and banks. I think that the base of power there are two key bases of power in the United States. One is a large corporation, and the second 
is the uh, federal government in Washington. When I talk, for instance, about a Council on Foreign Relations, it's not, the Council on Foreign Relations is not a place of power. It is a place where powerful people discuss. When I talk about the Bohemian Club and its Bohemian Grove retreat in Northern California, the Bohemian Grove is not a place of power. You are not powerful because you are at the Bohemian Grove. You're at the Bohemian Grove because you are powerful, and you are powerful because you're an owner and manager of a large corporation. So that's the root of, of the power uh, in the United States. There is what I call a corporate community, which means that the large corporations in America are interconnected through ownership, through sharing of information, through putting out products together, uh, through having the same directors, uh, through uh, hiring each other's managers, that it truly is, in that sense, a community. Um, and, and they are relatively tightly knit. They, they not only share then a common interest in making a lot of money, but they also believe they have common enemies, which is very important in making a community too. And their common enemies are environmentalists, labor, and of course those dreadful bureaucrats in Washington who in the American ideology are constantly harassing these poor beleaguered entrepreneurs who are just struggling to to deliver jobs for us. To make the third billion dollars. Yeah. So I think then when we say when you see that they and we do know this from interviews that they see themselves constantly under pressure from as I say labor environmentalists and from government trying to regulate them. That gives them a feeling of we against them. But, but more than that, they're not just, I don't just have, you know, one corporation and somebody else another one. We share that corporation. We have share it in ownership. We share it in directorship uh, and so on. So I do think that is the base of, of power in the United States, uh, Doug. And that, and that is something that people really don't like to, to uh, say. That is, they, they want to see power in individuals and not in General Motors and General Electric and uh, Exxon and, and Chase Manhattan Bank, but actually that's where I think the power is. Then from there, people like Henry Kissinger become very important to articulate the general policies that those people need to uh, continue. The corporate community does develop a set of generalists. Maybe a person, maybe for instance you start out running a particular corporation. You're doing a fine job, and you're asked to be on a couple or three other corporate boards. And from being on all those different corporate boards, you start to see the bigger picture. And now people say, Frank, would you go to Washington and testify and try to explain what, to these government officials what we need? You become a generalist for the corporations as a whole, and you may leave your particular job in any one corporation, but you're still part of the corporate community. You're not some individual floating around out there. You have an institutional base. You have a reference group in this uh, corporate community. That's right. Uh, so many people are from the Bechtel Corporation or in the Reagan administration, Secretary of State, mm -hmm. the Secretary of um, Defense, the Feds, right, right, and a couple right. of others. Yeah. And certainly they haven't lost their loyalty to the Bechtel Corporation. And the Bechtel Corporation yeah. is doing really well yeah. with the government contracts. Yeah. I want to ask you this. This seems like a contradiction in a way. In one hand, we say that the government is dominated or controlled by the wealthy, powerful people from the American ruling class. But on the other hand, we see that the business community grouses a lot about the bureaucrats in Washington. Now, are they grousing and complaining about their own people and the way they run the government, or are is it like uh, a, a couple of books I've seen where it's the inside directors, the managers of these corporations who have basically their one corporation up, uppermost in mind, complaining about the way the, the upper, their betters, the ruling class in Washington, is running the country for the benefit of themselves and the country. Mm -hmm. So you see this division at the absolutely highest level compared to the highest level of just merely one corporation? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really complex and important question because it does seem to be an anomaly that businessmen say that they're powerless and yet they have all of this money, they're the ones appointed to government and so on. So why is it that businessmen 
say they are powerless. I've thought about that a lot and uh, uh, read a lot about it and I've interviewed people. And I think that it has several levels to it as an answer. First of all, we have to come, we have to start with the fact that all Americans tend to have the, the view that government is uh, awful and rapacious. It's like, that's what we always complain about. Uh, that's, that's just sort of the way we talk. For instance, in the Reagan administration, they're constantly talking against big government, constantly complaining about government, and yet they're constantly getting all of these subsidies and being, you know, using the government in ways that's useful to them. So in one way, in one part of it, the answer is that it's, it's, it's just part of our rhetoric in America. But at a next level, and this uh, analysis comes from a political scientist who does not think there's a cohesive power lead, a man named Grant McConnell. He makes the point that by constantly criticizing these government officials, it keeps them on the defensive. You see, so it's a very good strategy if I walk in and I say, Doug, you're against me, aren't you? And they say, no, Bill, I'm not against you. Doug, you're always against me. You always seem to be not doing the stuff that really helps our corporation. This constant complaining about government keeps the government people kind of on the defensive and proving that they're all right. One of the best things that Kennedy ever did from the point of view of the business community was during his argument with uh, you, uh, the steel companies over, over the uh, over price rise that they did, uh, he made a comment to somebody, my father always told me businessmen were sons of bitches. Mm -hmm. Well, they constantly then used that on Kennedy, and he constantly had to prove <laughs> that he was okay. He and, right, and there's a wonderful book on, uh, on the free enterprisers that points out that uh, corporations did fantastically well under Kennedy. So it's, I think it's useful to do that. Now, but there's another level, and that is, you see, in the American government, the people that are the day-to-day -day employees do come from the, the middle levels of our society. The values of our country are such that it's no great individual fulfillment to become a government official because we look down on government so much. They're just politicians and bureaucrats. If this were uh, a European country with an aristocratic tradition, members of the upper class might say, gee, I think I'll go into the civil service. They would say and say, I'm thinking concretely here of England yeah. and of France. So that there might be many people in the government as permanent employees who were from the same class as the business people. But in America, that wouldn't be something you would do. If you had lots of money, you went to this nice prep school, now you've got this Yale degree, and you say, what am I going to do with my life? You're not going to say, oh, I'm going to go work for the government, unless it's the State Department. And there, there's some tradition of some upper class involvement. So they aren't part of the same networks. And in that sense, there's always the possibility that these government bureaucrats might, uh, we don't quite know them, so we don't maybe quite, you see, then trust them. There's that. There's also kind of residual level. idealism in the country at different times in history during the New Deal, during Kennedy in the 1960s. A lot of people were influenced to believe that we needed a stronger government, that the government should serve the mm -hmm. people. There's a populist tradition in the United States. And so some government, quote unquote, bureaucrats, we might say employees, have assimilated these beliefs That's that right. puts them in conflict with corporate power. There's also an anti-corporate tradition in the United States. That's it's right. not that everyone emulates and celebrates right. and goes along That's with the corporations. Right. Absolutely true. The reason I think your books have had impact in some quarters is because they have played to this distrust of excessive corporate mm -hmm. power and so you get this at times operative in the government where there actually are conflicts I, between I the state and the government and there is a relative autonomy to some of the government regulatory uh, agencies, mostly they're packed by people from business right. sharing the interests of yeah. business but occasionally you'll get a Nicholas Johnson in the FCC, okay. who really believes that the media should be ruled in the uh, common interest and will go against right. the networks. So you get this kind of contradiction. I think you're absolutely US. right, and it's by looking precisely at cases like the one you just <laughs> named, or if we looked at the Federal Trade Commission in the late, six, late 70s when Michael Perchek right. took it over, and he started to really use it to try to enforce various kinds of, of laws and regulations on the, uh, 
corporations, and they fought back against the FCC. But, Doug, I think you're absolutely right. I think that is the final level of, uh, of understanding uh, businessmen's concerns and feeling of powerlessness, and that's precisely the point that the, at, because Americans believe that government is uh, uh, potentially bad and domineering, and because of the populist democratic tradition of America, basically it says our government, you see, is founded on all the people. Governments in the past were founded on uh, divinities or uh, on kings, or the parliament founded a government, but ours clearly says power is in the people. And what that means is that in any American business person dominating that government, there's a certain way in which it's illegitimate. And the final point then that we think we pick up in interviews and, and, and uh, a couple of people have written about this, even for the 1920s, which we all assume was the heyday of business, there was always that fear that you, I think that you well put that namely the people might take over this government. So in that sense, it's not, it's not theirs in the legitimacy sense. And so there's always that concern with the underlying populist kind of thing. And it does manifest itself sometimes then in the, in the election of liberal people and, and, and then in the appointment of liberal officials. And, and you know, when, uh, when we were talking earlier about campaign finance and I was talking about people that rose to, to, to the heights in terms of running for president, running for vice president, uh, it's, it is also the case we can see it, we can all name some, that there are elected officials in the United States who are not part of the power elite. And they very often do oppose uh, uh, their position. So I have no doubt there are pro-labor, there are pro-environmental, there are very liberal elected officials at, at various levels in our society, and that does create then real conflict. So that m uh, my, my point would be, it's not that there aren't such people there, my point is, they usually lose, just as you say, with, I mean, in effect, if we look at the FCC or if we look at the FTC, if we look at various kinds of attempts to create, for instance, a consumer protection agency with some teeth, OSHA. what happens is OSHA we, OSHA, is that, we, that we eventually lose. They grind us down, and they grind us down because they have this institutional base behind them. They have more staying power, uh, and furthermore, eventually, with these liberal elected officials, they constantly run at these people. One of the things that's so interesting to me is to watch the way in which a liberal politician will come to Congress, and if he or she starts to really vote in a way that's constantly annoying to the business community, they will, quote, target that person. They will constantly send a lot of money to candidates that are running against this person in the district. So keeping the person on the defensive, letting them know that one false step, and they're going to eliminate them. So, uh, you see, my view is not of a power structure that's sort of sitting there and it's all signed, sealed, and delivered and never challenged. In America, the power structure is constantly challenged, but it basically constantly wins, except on, you know, occasionally it, it doesn't. But so, so there is real conflict in America, and I, I think your point really brings that out well. And, and uh, I, I think that it's important not to deny that, what but it's important the, to see who wins. That's, a, that's, the, that's the key to this, is that we do have a pluralistic society, but we do not have a pluralistic economic and political structure. I think that's excellent. I think that uh, we, I think we have the uh, paradox over the last 20 years that a lot of the social movements that have happened, a lot of the events have made in some way, in some ways this a very open society at the individual, personal, uh, a kind of level, mm -hmm. and yet I just continue to believe we have the same corporate power structure. And I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction in terms that, that uh, m my access to certain kind of information, my right to do things as an individual, which is a very important part of liberalism, that that could be increased in the society, and it has been for, for minorities, for women, for gays, for handicapped. Uh, those kinds of liberal individual freedoms could actually be in some way increased, and we could still be relatively powerless. Mm -hmm. We will continue our discussion with William Domhoff on our next program. We'll discuss conflicts within the ruling class itself, and also how it handles the ferment and struggles of the people below. How much to concede, how much to repress. We'll also discuss the control of elections and politicians by the ruling class. And finally, we'll talk about local power structures, their particular interests, and their relationship to the national power structure. I thought I'd share with you this 
observation by sociologist C. Wright Mills, who was the first to study power comprehensively in the United States. Freedom is measured by the amount of control you have over the things upon which you are dependent. Well, thank you for watching Alternative Views. We'd like to thank our camera person, Eric Eubank, our audio man, Kevin L. West, and our assistant editor, Irene Heimer. And as we do every week, we wish to thank Austin Community Television, ACTV, for the use of their facilities. Alternative View 1-3. We're getting close to concluding our ninth year and starting our tenth in producing Alternative Views. The program you've just seen is our 334th. And the program is viewed all over the country. We'd like to thank you for watching. Good night.